Okay, hello. My name's Harold Wilderson. Uh, it's a beautiful day today in the USA. Uh, it's a good day for the race. You wonder what race? Human race. <laughs> I got a little bit of boy left in me, I think. I just turned 72 not too long ago, but um, there is scripture for acting like this. The Bible says, except you become as little children, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Little children have lots to teach us. There's a place in the word, I don't know the exact scripture, but it says a little child shall lead them. Uh, and many times I've seen children setting a very good example for us adults. Uh, I've watched little children forgive each other. They'll get in a little spat and the next thing they're hugging each other. They're making up and they're ready to go again. Full steam ahead. We're going to be talking about full steam ahead today. Uh, part two. We talked about this here a couple of weeks ago and there was more I wanted to say about it. Uh, full steam ahead. Uh, Jesus said these words. He said the thief, meaning the devil, Satan himself, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then he goes on to say, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And so uh, today uh, we're going to talk about how Satan can take something that's really good that we have in our life and twist it around and somehow manage to steal and to kill and destroy. And we need to be careful. We need to watch out for him. In James, I think it's chapter 4, not sure. Uh, we're told to submit ourselves unto the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He doesn't have a chance. Uh, many times we uh, get to thinking the wrong thoughts and things like that. And we... Um, then we have to confess our sins. If we, if we dwell on that thought too much, it becomes sin. Uh, and the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. And uh, we need to be careful what we think. We need to remember that when a bad thought comes to our mind, the first thing we want to do is take authority over it. Submit ourselves unto the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I like to say, full steam ahead with his tail between his legs. He's got to go. He can't be there when we resist him in the name of Jesus. He's got to go. We're going to talk about full steam ahead. When I think about full steam ahead, uh, some of the things I said the first time on full steam ahead, I want to, I'll probably be repeating because uh, I need to add to that thought. I think of full steam ahead, I think of a steam locomotive. They threw lots more coal in the fire. They turned up the heat. They, the smoke is billowing out of those, that smokestack, and they're full steam ahead, feeling full power because they got to get to where they got to go. And uh, I remember as a little boy, a couple things, a lot of things I remember as a little boy. Uh, I remember as a little boy going to Altonwald, Pennsylvania. And, uh, it was about three miles up the road. There was the big thing in that in our little town of Altonwald was a feed mill. Doesn't sound very exciting, but you'll know why it was exciting after I tell you this story. As a little boy, I, Harold Wilderson, and my sister Faye Wilderson played in the cow stable. We were dairy farmers, and we were just little, not hardly big enough to help with a whole lot in there. Oh, Daddy was milking the cows, and we would play and one of the things we would do, um, we would go to the feed cart. The feed was made out of ground ear corn and barley and uh, a lot of other things, minerals and soybeans and all the stuff that it took to make the cow's milk really, really good. And we would go to the feed cart and we would pick through the feed. Every now and then you'd see a little ball about the size of a BB maybe of, it was something dark and we we would taste this stuff. We wanted to see what it was. And we found out that those little dark balls about the size of BB, sometimes they were a little bigger than that. They were actually molasses that daddy had mixed into the feed at the feed mill when they made our feed. And it pumped, they pumped it up out of the, uh, a big vat in the cellar of the feed mill. And uh, every now and then you'd see these little balls of molasses. And so we would pick them up and eat them. You got to remember, back then, we hardly ever had candy. 
uh, candy was like dying and going to heaven. And we just loved candy. We had, we, when you want something, if you like something, you can't get it. It's like you just want it all the more. And so we would eat these little bowls of molasses out of the feed. Another thing we did, uh, we had a big collie uh, there on the farm and a little rat terrier dog. And uh, Daddy would buy a whole 50-pound bag of Purina dog chow. And he'd set it in the corner of the cow stable. It was where they always kept it the same place. He'd open the whole top of the bag and roll the bag down so that King uh, would be able to walk. That was the calling. He could walk right up there. And there was other collies before him. He could walk right up there and just walk up and reach his head right in that bag and eat until his heart was content. He only ate that when he didn't have rabbits or groundhogs that he liked to catch. Uh, they liked that much better than Prina nuggets, but uh, they would eat uh, right out of the bag. Little tippy, she'd stand up on her back leg. She was a little rat terrier, and she'd reach in there, and she'd eat nuggets too. So we were just little kids, and so... If this uh, was good for them and they enjoyed it, we wanted to taste it. So Faye and I would reach in there and get one little nugget, Prina dog child nugget out, put it in our mouth. It tastes pretty good. You got to try it sometime. No doubt. <laughs> and we would eat a few nuggets and then we'd be on our way and we'd do something else and we would play and we enjoyed life. Until one day, as I was saying, we went to Outenwald at the feed elevator and we were there and, uh, one of the things that we did, uh, Daddy one day took us down into the cellar of that old feed mill and was just showing us around. Uh, the people that worked there were our friends. My dad's one brother worked there. Took us down the cellar. And we were walking around. He walked, we walked up to this big vat. It was about three feet deep. I think it was made out of concrete blocks. Uh, and in that vat was where they stored their molasses. Uh, the same molasses that we pick little pieces of out of the cow feed my sister and i and we looked in there and the first thing we saw uh, in a feed mill there are things uh, little critters that like to get in feed mills and eat and eat uh, grain mice and rats like to get grain and they like to eat sweet stuff and so we looked in there and i don't know how many rats and mice were in there floating on the surface of this molasses um they had gotten down in there and s tried to get some molasses and it was too, the sides were maybe too far to the top from the surface of the molasses to get back out. And they actually laid there and died in the molasses laying there on the surface, the dear little things. Well, that kind of knocked the props out of us from eating molasses out of the feet. <laughs> we kind of stopped that. But the other thing I wanted to tell you about Outenwald Elevator the train track came right past the elevator, the building itself, and there was a siding came right up within two feet, maybe. The, the train cars were probably two feet, maybe three feet at the most from the back of the building, and there was a like a little, you'd open the doors and they'd let, throw down a big sheet of uh, plate steel, and then they could run their bag wagons back and forth into the box cars and bring the feed out. And I remember those guys that moved that feed around were, they were strong. And uh, old brother Don Stahl, he was, he worked for, later on it was called, it went from the name Outenwald Elevator to Franklin Feed and Supply. Well, Don Stahl worked for there. He's a good Christian brother. And, and uh, he was strong as a bull. Oh, he was strong. I remember before we had bulk feed bins to receive our feed, we used bags, 100-pound sacks. They brought it out in 100-pound sacks. And old Don, he'd walk up the back of the feed truck and he'd grab two sacks of feed one in each hand and walk off with two 100 pound sacks of feed and just walk off with it. And he was strong. And that's how we got our feed there at the feed mill. And, and, uh, it was, uh, these little memories, uh, Dawn could, I had a big rope in the, up in the barn that I climb. I wanted to be strong like Dawn. That's what I wanted. And so, uh, the high school in Chambersburg was getting new ropes for in the gymnasium. And I asked Mr. Carroll, I said, Mr. Carroll, is there any way I could get one of these old ropes, the old sisal uh, ropes? And he said, well, sure. So he gave me one. It had a, uh, the rope had an end on it, a uh, metal around piece of pipe, like with a, a ring on the top. And uh, he gave me one. I went to the local blacksmith shop and uh, had him make me a, a plate about that long, about inch and a half wide, 
uh, with a hook on it so I could hook this rope on there and climb this rope. Well, I'd climb this rope. I'd pull myself up, hang onto the rope with both feet, put my put the rope between the top of my one foot and put the bottom of my other shoe on there and hold myself till I could reach up and climb, pull myself on up to the next level. Don walked up to that thing one day and he looked at me and he looked at the rope and he just walked up to it and just started going up that rope hand over hand. His feet were just dangling there. Went the whole way to the top and the whole way back down. And I'm like, my jaw's hanging down. How could you be that strong? He had muscles at places where I didn't even have places. And uh, strong. The thing that I want to talk about uh, that still had to do with this um, out in the world elevator was one day I was there and in came this steam locomotive. They brought it out of hiding, out of storage or whatever. I guess they just wanted to run it a little bit. By then, we had diesel locomotives. And most of you think that those diesels are powered by the diesel engine. Well, they're actually powered by electric motors. Even the ones we have today are electric motors that run those big uh, diesel locomotives. It's just the diesel engine. All it does is run a generator that runs power into those electric motors. They're actually electric trains, if you want to. It's similar to your toy electric trains that you have. You have little electric motors on the wheels. And anyhow, uh, the engineer got me up in the cab with him. It was just a wonderful experience. When I think of full steam ahead, I think of a steam locomotive. And I got to get in one and look at the controls, the place where they blew the whistle and all that stuff. And uh, so I... um, One of my points that I'm getting ready to bring across with all this in mind, as a little boy, uh, as a little boy, there was a song that came out. It was called The Wreck of the Old 97, and we talked a little bit about this the last time. Uh, The train down in Virginia from Monroe to Danville had a grade coming down along the side of the mountain, uh, and it was a three-mile grade. And they were running late. They were about a half hour, an hour behind time. And they were hauling mail for the United States Post Office. And you had to be on time. Every minute that you were late, they charged you big time for every minute. And so he was running late, and they told him to he's going to have to speed it up. And he had to hammer down. That's what we say today. But he, was, he, he told his fireman, he said, pour on the coal. We got to make some time. And so they were full steam ahead. Doing as, going as fast as that old steam locomotive would take this mail train. And they were coming down this three-mile grade. And in the song, it says uh, they were coming down the grade making 90 mile an hour. People, Other historians have said that it might not have been quite that fast, but that's how the song goes. And uh, and it said when his whistle, they were, they were coming into Danville. And to come into Danville, there's a bridge at the bottom of this grade around to, I, I pictured it around to the left, onto this big trestle that they had to go to cross to go into Danville. And uh, he was coming down the grade making 90 mile an hour when the whistle broke into the scream. The people in Danville heard this scream and whistle on this train. They knew something was wrong because they didn't usually blow their whistle coming into that curve, coming into Danville. When the whistle broke into a scream and the story goes, the song goes, they found him in the wreck. The st- he, they lost it. Uh, the steam rolled down into this big ravine, down to the stream down below, and uh, they found him in the wreck with his hand on the throttle, scalded to death by the steam. I tell you that story. It's gross. It's terrible. It's awful. I tell you that story. It was a true story. It was in the papers. People from all over the country came in, news people, to see this terrible wreck. Lots of people were killed. Uh, and uh, my thought is, Steam, a wonderful thing, a wonderful, wonderful way to get things done. And our enemy, Satan himself, has a counterfeit for everything good that God has, pretty much everything. And he just tries to get people to follow his uh, way of doing things. And I think he got a hold of this dear engineer's uh, reasoning and he just he was just pouring on the coal, so they say, and the black smoke was coming out of that thing. He was coming down that grade, and he lost it because he was taking something good, and it was being misused. It was using used to go way, way, way too fast coming into that town, and he lost it, and he was killed. 
Satan wants to come and steal and kill and destroy. That whole thing was of Satan. He was the one that wanted to kill and destroy. And many times in our day-to-day walk, we'll hear news of somebody, a tornado or, or a terrible tragedy of whatever it is. And Satan's behind stealing and killing and, de- killing and destroying. And so full steam ahead. That's an example of full steam ahead. And that's what I think of. I think of that song when I think of the words full steam ahead. However, uh, there's a good side to this. Full steam ahead is what God wants out of us. He doesn't want us mamby-pambying around and having all this authority and power that he, that's part of our um, benefits package when we receive, we receive Christ as our Savior. There are so many wonderful things that he has for us. And he, he gives us, uh, when we receive Christ as our Savior, we can, we can claim a, a full uh, package of energy. And uh, we can claim a whole package of healing a whole package, part of the package would be uh, safety, uh, watching over us as we travel uh, around over the world, and comfort. Part of the package is comfort and, and blessings and encouragement in our lives right from God the Father. He wants to take care of us that much. And he wants us to go full steam ahead. He wants to, us to use that quote-unquote steam in our lives that's available to us, uh, the power of God, the authority of God. He wants us to use it and and just go forth full steam ahead and get the job done. Not talking about it, but actually getting up off your keister and going and getting the job done. Get out there and tell somebody about Jesus when the Lord says to you, tell brother so-and-so, you know, that you believe he's being called to uh, go tell his second cousin maybe about Jesus. You just sense that in your spirit, the Lord spoke to you and you go and share that with your friend or you go yourself and share the gospel with somebody that you know needs to be saved and uh, full steam ahead. So uh, one of the things uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, in this book that I've been reading again, I was, it wasn't more about two weeks ago, maybe it was towards the end of November and, uh, I was praying and the Lord said, go pick up that book, great gazing into glory and read it. Here it is gazing into glory. I got it from Sid Roth back in 2011 and I'd read it and I marked it all up. It, my book is all marked up. The edges will have little lines. If you follow the end to the end of that little line, you open it up and there will be an asterisk and there will be a great thought that you just really thought was, was outstanding. So when you pick the book up 10 years later, excuse me, uh, you can get to all the really good stuff that really stood out to you without reading the whole book again. And so I went, I followed the Lord's leading and went, walked into my office and there on the bookshelf right in front of me. I didn't know how I was going to find it. I didn't know where it might be. I walked in and within 10 seconds, probably it was right there looking at me. And I was like, Oh, I was like, I grabbed that thing and I started reading. Well, um, yesterday morning, Wednesday or Thursday morning, this is, Today is Friday. Uh, I was getting dressed. And um, in my spirit, I just felt like I'm missing something. What am I missing? And so I cried out to the Lord. I was there all by myself. I cried out to the Lord and I said, what am I missing? And uh, many times in scripture, you'll read about people crying out to the Lord. The Israelites did it when they were crossing the desert. For 40 days, you're out in the desert and they'd get themselves in trouble by disobeying the Lord and they'd cry out to God and God would hear their prayers and answer their prayers. And we're going to be, I'm going to read in some parts of this book. Um, and I'm going to be reading some scripture that I have here in front of me. And I don't know how to get it all done, but we're going to pick, choose and pick here a little bit. Uh, pick and choose, I guess they say. Uh, we'll skip a few things. We're going to just get right into it. And we're going to figure out how it is that we can draw close to God and how he will draw close to us. We have to make the first move towards him. And then he'll make a move towards us and we'll draw together and, and we'll realize that Jesus is the vine. He said these words, I am the vine, you are the branches. And we need to be hooked up to the right vine. There's other vines out there, but he is the vine. And he is divine. And we are branches on this vine. 
And as we abide in him, you abide in him by fellowshipping with him, talking to him, listening to him talk to you. Sometimes it's through the word, the word of God. Uh, Jesus in John chapter one, it said that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then on down about verse 15, maybe it says in the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That would have been Jesus. And so as we abide in him by abiding in the word, he's the word and he abides in us. Well, he's abiding in us. He's been abiding in me ever since I was about nine years old back in 1960 in December. I remember giving my little heart to Jesus and uh, he's been here ever since he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Isn't that good? In this world today, people will, you'll think they're your best friend and they'll up and leave you uh, and turn on you. Uh, it happens with husbands and wives sometimes. And it's so sad. But Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Oh, that's a comfort to me. And you, if you if you don't have Jesus in your heart, you can't put this verse into practice. You have to have Jesus in your heart. And then you'll have somebody that will never leave you or forsake you. He'll be your best friend. I, a multimillionaire told me one day, he said, Harold, consider yourself very fortunate if you have one true friend well i have one true friend and then he was talking about people here on earth but i I have one true friend in jesus to start with and then i have some other friends that i would call true friends he said count yourself very fortunate if you have one true friend somebody that'll be with you when you're down when you you'd fallen into down over the rocks or you'd fallen into sin whatever it is as a christian we're human beings and sometimes we mess up I remember in 2014, I messed up big time and I, I was so down. I was never this down before in my life, but I was so down that I walked over to my piano and sat down. And I, at that point, that very moment, I felt like Jesus didn't even love me anymore because I was such a bad person. And, and, uh, I sat down and I, felt led to start singing Jesus loves me and as I sang Jesus loves me I sensed the love of Jesus he still loved me he loved me all the time but I just I felt so bad that I didn't think he did I started singing Jesus loves me and I sat there and wept I couldn't even hardly sing for crying tears were running down my cheeks singing Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so little ones to him belong they are weak but he is strong yes Jesus loves me Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. It's a little, it's, it's probably been my favorite song as a little boy growing up. And it's still probably right up there close to the top of the list of favorite songs. And I sing it many times, probably a couple of times a week. I'll stop and sing Jesus loves me among other songs that I like to sing. And I play piano and we never had lessons because we didn't have that much money to spend on lessons. So we weren't allowed to have musical instruments in our church. And so our daddy bought us an old upright piano and put it in the hallway of the old farmhouse. And us kids would plunk away on it. And we, a couple of us, three of us, I guess, actually learned to play piano just by listening to songs and then trying to reproduce it on the piano. And we would sing. And uh, we just loved to sing together. We always liked music. Um, so it's been a good life. Jesus in our hearts. And he, Jesus, I want to finish this verse. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you abide in me and I abide in you, which he's been doing ever since 1960 in December, uh, that he said, you will bear much fruit. And when I'm praying, I almost always include that in my prayer. Lord, I'm so grateful that you're my vine and I, I'm one of your branches. And as I abide in you and you abide in me, we bear much fruit. Without him, I can do nothing. There's one of those words that's in the Bible. There's nothing and all. And there's a couple other words that have just been really standing out to me. He, Jesus said one time to his disciples, he said, uh, Behold, I give unto you authority. King James says power. But the original Greek word meant authority. Behold, I give unto you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all. Oh, that's beautiful. All the power of the enemy. That means all the power of the enemy. Satan has imps and demons and he probably has a whole army and a Navy and Air Force and and the Marines. What all he has, all of it, 
put together. Everything, all the power that Satan has, all of it, you have more when it comes. Authority is way more than power, the power that Satan has. We have authority, and you can have all the power in the world as the devil himself. And it's nothing compared to what you have as a child of God when it comes uh, to having the victory because you have authority. You have authority in the name of Jesus. And we need to know how to use that authority as we walk through this life. Um, In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve walked and talked with God. They were face to face with God. They, they, uh, They enjoyed that. And that's what we need. We need to be face to face with God. And sometimes it'll be through an angel. Sometimes it'll be through more than one angel. And I've had times where the angel of the Lord intervened for me. If not, I wouldn't even be here right now. There were times where I should have been dead and the angel of the Lord intervened and saved me from total destruction. And I'm so grateful for all that. And we need to to see into the spiritual world. Uh, I could talk for hours on times when uh, God intervened for me. God was there for me. God helped me. He helped me. <laughs> I I got to tell you this. It came to me this morning as I was thinking about this. And uh, I remember the first miracle that I saw. I saw it right in front of my eyes. We were at camp meeting. They had called this evangelist in. And if they had known this guy was filled with the Holy Spirit and had the gift of healing and all kinds of other gifts uh, that were going on in his life. I think if they'd have known that, they probably wouldn't have invited him because they weren't very much for healing and stuff like that when I was a kid growing up. You just went to church on Sunday morning. And I think we well, come, boiled right down to it. We were just playing church. I mean, we we would receive Jesus, and it, was, it wasn't all bad, but there was a form of godliness, but it was like they denied the power thereof. And we were at camp meeting, and after the meeting that evening, we went up into uh, one of the cabins there on the campground, and uh, the evangelist was there, and and, uh, people that needed healing uh, were coming into that cabin after the church service, and I remember my sister, Ada, she was sitting there, she was having, I think she was having severe back pain, and they put her in the hot seat, and somebody got in front of her, and she put her legs straight out, because the evangelist apparently saw in the spirit that her trouble was in her back Uh, her trouble was her back was out of line and they held her feet up together and one foot i remember and they held them up the one foot the one leg was like i'd say at least an inch shorter than the other one so he laid hands on her and prayed and back then you were supposed to shut your eyes when you pray but i was watching i wanted to see what happened and uh, if i couldn't pray if the only time i could pray with with was with my eyes shut, I wouldn't get much praying done in a day's time. We're supposed to pray without ceasing. And I uh, I pray a lot when I'm moving, when I'm going down the road. It's nice to have your eyes shut when you're going down the road or I'm on my tractor or whatever I'm doing, uh, pray with my eyes open. So that day, even though it was frowned on, I, I was praying with this evangelist as he was praying for my sister. And I watched, I watched as her foot I'm going to, I'm going to exaggerate her foot went like, like this three three jerks and they were when it was all said and done both legs were the same length and it was the first time I saw the power of God over somebody's body that needed healing I saw that and uh that was some of my first uh introduction into the power of God into healing and all the good things God has for us as his kids and so one of the first things, um, I'm not sure what my time is right now. Somebody's going to have to stop me. I didn't lay my phone down beside me to see what time to stop. But one of the things that uh, it takes to see into the glory of God, to uh, gaze into glory, to have the glory uh, on you and around you, uh, one of the things is that we need to have passion for, for Jesus. And... Uh, we need to uh, pursue him, not just sit around and say our little prayers and things like that, but we need to pursue him and uh, be passionate about something uh, and not just sit there and do nothing. We need to go after him. And uh, there's some stories in this book, Gazing into Glory. I'd like to share a couple of them with you. Um, 
one of the uh, things that he shared was that when he first started dating his wife, uh, they were engaged and she was in Fiji and he was in America and uh, they hadn't talked over the phone much. And when they did, uh, he said, I, I called her and I didn't quite know her voice that well yet. Didn't know whether it was her or someone else in her family. He didn't, he didn't know her voice, but over time as intimacy and relationship developed, I learned to discern her voice. Even in the room of hundreds, I could, he knew her voice. I didn't stop after the first couple of times of not recognizing her voice. Voice, I was passionate. I pursued her. I was like, I was, I was uh, pursuing her. And I, and I said, I was passionate because I, because I was passionate, I pursued our relationship until it became, began to blossom. And now the fruit of that passion is intimacy. And uh, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And he loves he loves us and and we hear his voice and we become passionate. The more we hear his voice, the more we want to hear it. And you have to go after him with passion and confess. He, he says, and confess, it's James 5, 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's fervency and passion. It will be evident in your life. Uh, you got to go after it. You can't just sit around mamby pamby around if you want to get close to God and see the glory of God in your life and see miracles happening as you get closer and closer. Um, passionate people will do what mediocre people will never do in their zeal to obtain their heart's desire. Um, just rolling along here. I don't know where my time is, but I'm going to keep going until somebody stops me, I guess. Um, how would you like your home to be the headquarters of the next great move of the Spirit in your region? The key's passion. So he made haste. It was talking about Zacchaeus. He made haste and come down. He was so short he couldn't see Jesus. Jesus was coming, but he was passionate enough to go out ahead of the crowd and get up in a tree, and it, his home became headquarters for Jesus uh, during uh, the time that Jesus was here on the earth, after uh, Zacchaeus gave his heart to the Lord, and he climbed a sycamore tree. And the old story, the it's kind of a it's just a story, I guess. But they say sycamore trees, if you've seen one, their bark is kind of loose and it peels off and falls on the ground. And they say that's because Zacchaeus climbed a tree and got the bark loosened up too much. Uh, so that's the story behind sycamore tree. Uh, the second thing you need, need to do is, is have purity. Uh, Matthew 5, 8 says, the pure in heart shall see God. The blood of Jesus is a great equalizer. It makes no difference what you did before you came to Christ because if you have accepted Jesus and been washed in the blood, you now have a pure heart before God. The blood of Jesus cleanses us, not from some, some unrighteousness, but from all unrighteousness. I like that word all. Here's an example found in Mark. Uh, blind Bartimaeus, remember him? He was a beggar. Uh, he went out, Jesus uh, and his disciples went to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And here's another example of crying out. There have been a couple times in my life where I cried out to God and he heard my prayer and answered my prayer. Sometimes we need to get serious about this and cry out to God. Don't sit there and mamby pamby around with, oh Lord, you're such a wonderful God and I'm here just suffering for Jesus and on and on we go. We need to cry out for God. Get right to the point. He doesn't have time. He's got millions, billions of people. He can listen to all of us at the same time. That's, that's where uh, we uh, have to just trust in the Lord, know that he hears us because how do you hear that many people at the same time? Just trust in him with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. Uh, that was a little enlightenment I had here recently. Don't lean unto your own understanding. He can hear you no matter. He's, he's not a human being. God is a God is God, the God of the universe. And he can hear us all when we're crying out to him and uh, just trust in him with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. You don't have to figure out how he does it all at the same time. 
In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. Okay, so here's blind Bartimaeus. He cried out. And uh, then many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more. They told him to shut up. You're bothering Jesus. He cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. And it reminds me also of the woman with the issue of blood. There she was. She cried out that she wanted to see Jesus. She heard he was coming to town. She heard he was coming to town, and she knew that there was going to be a crowd pressing in. She had an issue of blood. She was bleeding to death. And she said these words, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. And she said that over and over again. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you hear the word of God and you hear it by saying it. You repeat it. You memorize it. And you say it over and over again until it drops from your head down into your heart. That's when it becomes faith as a green mustard seed, mustard seed, pure faith. And things start happening in your life. And so she touched the hem of his garment. The reason it says him, him, I believe, instead of his shoulder or wherever she might have touched him, was because she knew that they were going to be pushing and shoving, trying to get to Jesus. Thousands of people out there. Jesus would preach to thousands at a time. And it always talked about 5,000. And it was, that was just the men, plus the women, plus the children. He would have 10, 15, 20,000 people at a time pushing in, trying to get to him. And, and this dear lady with the issue of blood knew that, and she knew to get to Jesus, she was probably have to gonna be able have to get down on her hands and knees and crawl through the legs of these big men that were pushing and shoving and trying to get to Jesus. She was gonna have to crawl between her legs, and she finally got to Jesus, and she reached up and touched the hem of his garment. Jesus immediately said, "Who touched me?" He knew it. Somebody touched him, and the disciples who weren't quite up to uh, understanding how Jesus operated, they said, Jesus, what do you say? You said, who touched me? These people are pushing and shoving and pushing each other around, trying to get to you, bumping into you, knocking you around, and you're saying, who touched me? He said, I perceived healing, uh, virtue. Some different translations say different things. Go out of my body. And she heard what Jesus said, and she looked up, and she said, it was me, Lord. And he looked down at her, and he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. She repeated the fact that Jesus was coming to town. If she could just touch the hem of his garment, she would be made whole. And she told everybody. She told her sister when she stopped in one day. She told the lady beside her. She was getting oranges, and the other lady was getting bananas. She told her, did you hear that Jesus is coming to town? I have this issue of blood, and if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'm going to be made whole. And she repeated She'd go to bed at night saying this. Finally, it dropped from her head down into her heart, down into her spirit. And she knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, there was no doubt in her mind at that point where this little fate, bit of faith, this size of mustard seed, by the time she got to his garment and touched him, there was no doubt. It was pure faith. And she was instantly made whole. And so, um, so Jesus went about healing the sick raising the dead. Uh, and this little blind man cried out with passion. And Jesus healed him. When he cried out to him, moving right along, there's another key to entering into the glory, to seeing things start to happen in your life. Uh, talked about just talked about purity we talked about the fact that he cried out and he responded as a cry of passion the, the next thing I wanted to talk about was obedience we need to be obedient um, why is it that we missed this we need to be obedient to the word and some of us think that we're going to get things done in the kingdom 
and be disobedient, not listen to the voice of the Lord. Um, and we say things like, Lord, I want to be obedient to your word as best I can. Help me in my lack of obedience. If that is your heart and you love him, then you can be assured that to those who love him, he will openly show himself face to face. And why is it that we miss this? I believe that there are a number of reasons we, why we have failed to see this truth and embrace it. First, I believe many in the church have embraced a form of godliness, but have denied the power thereof. We have seen modeled a powerless gospel that has become more religious than relational. And I'd like to just say here, uh, religion is a word I don't like to hear very often. I don't like to hear it. I don't like the word. Religion never got anybody to heaven. It's a relationship with Jesus that'll get you into the kingdom. And the second reason is that we've never been taught that we actually could do this. Um, he talks about, in the, in the book, he talks about uh, some of the reasons, and I just, I just th think uh, that as we totally turn our heart to God and become obedient to his word. And the only way you can be obedient to the word is to know the word. And um, I think Jesus said one day, if you know the word, happy are you if you do my words. Uh, you shall know the word and the, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. Uh, it's lots easier to do ministry when you learn to do only what you see the Father doing. And in this book, it talks about watching the Father, watch what he does, and then do it. Do what he does. Say what he does. Say what he says. And that's the secret to uh, be able to get into seeing into the glory. He was in a church one time and he saw Jesus. This guy wrote the book. Saw Jesus standing there and the pastor was there. And he came up and asked the pastor. Jesus came up and asked the pastor. He came, I mean, it was Jesus appeared right there in the church. Uh, and he asked this pastor, his name was Glenn, uh, what it was that he wanted. And he replied, reported back to Jesus God I want you I want whatever you want whatever you want we want instantly heaven invaded earth in that room again that night and so I would like to share one more thing if I have time uh, God will come into your life he'll come and talk to you he'll give you visions he'll give you dreams uh, I remember as a boy, before I gave my heart to Jesus, I would dream. I'd have these nightmares of where I died and I went to hell. I remember the flames. I remember uh, how terrible it was. And it was a recurring dream. It would happen over and over again. Fast forward, I gave my heart to Jesus. And I had a new kind of dream later on. After giving my heart to Jesus, I had this newer dream, and the dream was, and I could take you right to the spot on the face of the earth where I was standing when this all happened. In my dream, there was an old wash house there behind our main house, and there was a one of those big bushes, I forget what you call them, they have big white balls, and if you give them the right kind of minerals, you'll get pink balls, and a little more of that mineral, you get blue balls. And I know the name of the bush, but it's not coming to me right now, but it doesn't matter. I was standing right there beside that bush and the rapture took place. In my dream, the rapture happened. And I remember in my dream uh, being ripped off the face of the earth. I mean, I went straight up. The G-force from taking off the way I did was so strong that all my insides went down into my pelvic area. It was painful, very painful. I remember the pain as I raptured. <laughs> Have you ever dreamed of rapturing? That was a, it was a great dream. It was painful. It was the best pain I've ever experienced in all my life. It was really, it was really good pain. 
and I raptured, and it was so sweet and so beautiful. After having all those nightmares of going to hell, I would get out of my bed before this dream. I would get out of my bed right after one of those nightmares of going to hell, and I get down on my knees beside my bed in the middle of the night and pray to God to have mercy over my soul. And I, I resisted the call of Jesus for a couple of years, and then at the ripe old age of nine, I finally gave my heart to Jesus, and it was such a beautiful thing. And next time, uh, we have some more stuff we want to talk about, but um, I don't know if somebody's going to stop me or if I'm going to keep going. If, I thought if I had time, I would read this uh, story of Jacob and how that he was, um, I'll start right here. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, Haran, however you pronounce it. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and laid it down in that place to sleep. And it reminded me uh, back when I was a boy, we went to Ephrata, Pennsylvania. There's a place there that's a tourist attraction now, but it was called Ephrata Cloister uh, in Lancaster County. And there uh, the men stayed in one department and the women were in another department. They didn't uh, sleep together. I don't think they just were there and that's what they thought God was calling them to do. And the more they felt like they were tortured in life, the more rewards they would have when they get to heaven. And one of the things I noticed, the men slept on, I think they were oak planks, probably two by twelves, about two of them beside each other. And they would lay down on those planks and I guess they had some blankets or something they put over them. But their pillow was a block of wood. And as a little boy, I remember it looked to me like a four by four uh, hunk of wood, maybe a foot and a half long. And they lay on these old hard planks and put their head on a piece of wood. And when I read this about Jacob laying down, he got a big old stone and laid it down for him to put his head on. And uh, he'd put his head on there to sleep. And so then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it at the top of the ladder. Uh, and I'm the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. That means a lot of people. Uh, and you shall s spread abroad to the west and the east and to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Um, I remember um, scripture where it says, Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And that's what he told Jacob as he had this dream. And uh, it says, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the, surely the Lord is in this place. I know I do not, and I did not know it. Uh, there's a place in scripture where God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. He didn't know that God was in that place, but he knew it now. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is, is the gate of heaven. Uh, sometimes we use the word portal. Uh, in my house, I think there's a portal into heaven more than once. I've been in that corner of the house and I'd see either an angel of the Lord or Jesus standing there himself and I would see him there and it was it's my favorite part in my house is a recliner there and many times I have uh, talks with the Lord and I've seen the Lord. I'll look and I'll see and it'll just disappear. And I've seen it one time in church, the same thing happening. And I just, I just want to say to you today, uh, you need to receive Jesus. And it's getting late. We have, we don't know how much time it could be today. It could be 10 years from now. It could be 100 years from now. But Jesus is going to return and you need to be ready. And if you aren't ready, I encourage you right now, before I stop speaking, say, Jesus, please come into my heart. I want to serve you. I don't want to do, uh, I don't want to happen to me 
what happens to those who don't receive you and they burn in hell it's a real place and you don't have to go there it was prepared god prepared that place for the devil and his angels the one that wants to come and steal and kill and destroy it's prepared for them not for you and so please receive jesus as your savior and uh, we're going to stop here i want to pray with you lord jesus thank you so much for your word thank you we can stand on your word thank you that we can go with you and go full steam ahead into reaching out to the whole world and through our lives and through our testimonies and the blood of the lamb there will be exponential growth in your kingdom and we don't know how it works we don't have we don't understand it we don't have to understand it but there will be exponential growth in your kingdom as we share the gospel and those people share the gospel and on and on where millions of people will come into your kingdom through our lives and our testimonies and the blood of the lamb we just love you so much we worship you we praise you we adore you and we want to honor you in all that we do we love you so much in jesus name amen